Cornwall Church, it is so great to be together as always. If we've not met, my name is Scott. I'm the campus pastor at our Skagit Valley location. Special shout out to my friends in Skagit. I am so excited to be with you next week, but honored to be here in Bellingham. If you're watching online, welcome. Any of our community sites, Belize, or right here in the room in Bellingham, it is always an honor to be with you. Um, before I get into sharing some thoughts that, that um, I'm really excited to share, I wanted to pause and reflect ever so briefly on the service last weekend. How many of you got to be a part of that? Yeah. One church, one location. Man, was it incredible to be together, one location, worshiping God together. Ron and Sarah did such a great job leading worship. Bob brought, Pastor Bob brought just an incredible message. And of course, baptism. Who ever gets tired of baptism? Eleven in advance said they wanted to be baptized. Two spontaneous in the moment said, I want to get dunked. I want to proclaim my love for Jesus and Man, I am so grateful. I am so grateful for God's faithfulness, for God's goodness, and for the way that God continues to work in and through Cornwall Church. So I just want to invite you to join me in praying a prayer of gratitude this morning before we get started. God, you are amazing, and we are so grateful for your goodness, for your faithfulness, for the ways that you are at work in and through Cornwall. The ways that that people's lives are being changed because of your love, because of your goodness. I love you and I pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said... Amen, amen. Hey, um, by the way, if you were not able to be there, if we do another event like that, please do everything in your power to get there because it was electric. It was incredibly special. Um, Do you remember the first time that you had to say, I'm sorry? or I forgive you. Think back. For you, it might have been not that long ago, depending on your age. For some of you, it might have been a little bit longer ago. Um, For me, it was when I was around eight to 10 years old. Certainly not the first time I needed to say I'm sorry, I'm sure, but it's the first time I remember. I was downstairs in the house that I grew up in with my sister, Laura, who's two years older than me. I don't remember what she was doing or saying, but man, she got to me. She got to me and I was like, I had enough. And I just pulled my fist back and I was like, and I hit her as hard as I could in the shoulder, in the shoulder. But when I hit her, I felt the muscles split like the Red Sea before Moses and the bone that was on the backside. And immediately I was like, "Uh uh-oh. I immediately felt terrible about what I had just done. I knew that I had acted out in a way that was unacceptable. And also would lead to me getting in trouble. (laughs) My sister started crying. She ran upstairs. My mom said, Scott! And I was like, yes, be right there. And I ran upstairs. And um, she said, you need to apologize right now for what you did to your sister. But to my mom's credit, she said to my sister and Laura, you need to forgive or you need to um, ask your brother to forgive you. You need to say you're sorry because he did not do this without you doing something to provoke him. And I was like, wise woman, (laughs) wise woman. But in that moment, there was a strain. There was a fracture in my relationship with my sister. I don't know if you've been there, but, but here's the thing. In those moments, you feel distance. You feel hurt. You feel frustration. You feel anger. And yet what we see is when we are willing to say those hard words, those three hard words, whether it's I am sorry or I forgive you, what was fractured can be made new. What was separate can be brought together. And my sister and I willingly said, I'm sorry and I forgive you. And our friendship was restored in a beautiful way. Forgiveness is powerful. Um, certainly, we aren't the first siblings in the, in the course of history uh, that needed to say, I'm sorry. Uh, if you go back to the beginning of the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, we read of two brothers who some nasty stuff happens right away, get a little bit further, and there are two other brothers in Genesis 25 to 33, and I want to recount this story for you because it is both a tragic story, but an incredibly beautiful story in the end. It is a redemptive story in the end. This is the story of Jacob and, Jacob and Esau. Um, so they, their parents, Isaac and Rebekah, want to have children. They are unable to have children. They pray, and God answers their prayer and gives them a double blessing. Twins. Some of you know what that's like. It's like, oh, good heavens. <laughs> um, 
He, God answers their prayer, gives them twins. Esau is the firstborn. Jacob is right on his heels. When Esau was born, what we see is that the Bible describes him as a red-haired Wookiee. Not literally, in case you're like, I don't remember reading that. But it literally says in scripture that he was covered in thick red hair like a fur coat. Jacob is not described that way, which is why I would say they're likely to be fraternal twins. But what we see is as these two age, as they get older, as they grow up, they become more and more different. Esau is an outdoorsman. He's a hunter. Jacob is the predecessor to Gordon Ramsay. He loves the culinary arts and he cooks. And one day Esau comes back from a hunt and he was unsuccessful and he is famished. He is starving. And Jacob had just met, made a red stew that apparently smelled really good because Esau was like, give me some of that. And like a loving younger brother, he was like, of course. No, he wasn't. He was like, what will you give me for it? Right? Let's trade. Let's barter. What are you going to give me for it? And Jacob says to his older brother, I'll trade you for your birthright. The birthright was the gift of the patriarch to the firstborn male. It was of incredible worth and responsibility because it was, the value was such that the patriarch's responsibility is to provide and protect all of their family, their servants, and their flocks. Huge responsibility, but incredible value. And I don't know where Esau is in this moment. I don't know if he's just hunger dumb, if his prefrontal cortex is underdeveloped. I don't know what happened to him or if he was literally concerned that he was going to die, but he was like, okay. So he trades his birthright for a bowl of soup. He eats the soup and immediately following, what we see is that he resents Jacob and he resents his decision. A few years later, their dad Isaac is getting sick and he's not doing well. And he says, Esau, who was his favored son, will you go out, hunt, bring home a fresh animal, make the meal that you know I love? In essence, this is like a last meal kind of request. So Esau says, of course, dad. He goes out and he starts the hunt. Well, Rebecca's favorite is Jacob. And so they plot together to get another animal more quickly to prepare the meal and to bring it to Isaac and to deceive Isaac into giving Jacob the birthright, the blessing of the birthright. So Jacob does this. He brings an animal back. And because Jacob is different, again, in physical stature, in terms of interests, he puts on clothes that have been outside that have that real outdoorsman funk to them. And he actually gets animal skins and puts them on his forearm so that when his dad touches him, that he believes it's Esau. He goes in, he brings the meal to Esau, and Esau says, come close, let me touch you. Or excuse me, um, Isaac says, come close, let me touch you. And he does, and he feels his forearms, and he's like, okay, this is Esau. And he's like, but that was quick. How'd you get here? And then Jacob deceives. His deceit goes to a deeper, darker level. He says, well, the Lord blessed me. He brings God in on his deceit. The Lord blessed me with an easy kill right away, so I was able to bring it to you quickly. Isaac unknowingly gives his blessing to Jacob. Jacob leaves. Esau comes home, prepares the meal, brings it into his dad. And his dad's like, I don't understand what happened. I already gave the blessing of the birthright to you. And Esau says, not to me. And then he realizes he gave it to his tricky younger brother, Jacob. And Esau is enraged. He is absolutely beside himself. Genesis 27, verse 41, it says this, Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. He said to him, the days of mourning for my father are near, meaning my father is going to die soon. I will mourn his death and then I will kill my brother, Jacob. I am going to kill my brother for what he has done to me. He has transgressed against me. What he did was absolutely wrong and I will get my revenge. Rebecca hears Esau say this and so she tells her favored son, Jacob, run away and don't look back. Jacob runs away and he doesn't look back. He's like, run away, run away. He runs away and he doesn't look back for 20 years can you imagine being separate from somebody and the last words you heard were, I am going to kill you? For 20 years, that phrase 
is rolling over Jacob's mind. He's thinking about it. He's, he's um, dreaming about it. 20 years, two decades, Jacob gets married. They have children, accumulate great wealth. And Jacob says, it's time to go home. It's time to go home. And as they go home, they know that it's likely that they're going to run into Esau. And so he puts together a plan because when he runs into Esau, he knows that Esau may want to make good on his threat. And so they get all sorts of gifts up front and, and they're prepared for what they're going to do as a family. And one day they're walking across um, this field and they see, they see Esau and 400 of his closest elite assassins on the horizon. And I imagine Jacob goes, uh-oh, uh-oh, what's going to happen? And so they put the plan into action. Jacob goes out in front of everybody. He bows down seven times in front of Esau. That's the greeting fit for a king. Jacob is trying to assuage any desire for revenge that Esau has. He's submitting himself to Esau. He's surrendering himself to Esau. And then the question is, what does Esau do? How does Esau respond? And if this were a movie, can you imagine the intense music in the background and the, the intensity is building and there's this moment where they're coming together and it's like, what is going to happen? And what happens, I don't think anybody could see coming. Genesis 33 verse four says, but Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. They wept. And they wept. Instead of holding the grudge, continuing to harbor resentment or bitterness or seeking revenge, Esau forgave Jacob. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. Isn't that incredible? Absolutely powerful. And they wept. 20 years they were separate from one another as brothers. And in this moment, I believe they wept because there is a beautiful reunion, a beautiful coming back together, a beautiful healing that took place because of forgiveness. Without forgiveness, this incredible moment would be an impossibility. Without forgiveness, this incredible moment would be an impossibility. This tragic, but in the end, redemptive story is one of many that exemplifies the importance of forgiveness in the kingdom of God. It, re it reflects the centrality of the theme of forgiveness in the gospel, the good news of great joy for all the people. Forgiveness is central to our faith as followers of Jesus. And that's why it should be of no surprise to any of us when God, through the apostle Paul in Ephesians 4.32 says this, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Pretty straightforward. We are called to be kind, to be compassionate, to be sensitive, to be thoughtful of others, what they're thinking, what they're feeling, what they're experiencing. But then Paul is pointing out the obvious. You're living a life amongst other human beings and none of you are perfect, which means it's only a matter of time before you are hurt. And in that moment, my call upon your life is to forgive just as Christ forgave you. To forgive is a God-given, Jesus-modeled command. It's a God-given, Jesus-modeled command. If we were to forgive just as Jesus did, we have to answer the question, how did Jesus forgive? And as I thought about that, that question, again and again, the same picture came to my mind, this, this perfect representation of God's forgiveness, of Jesus' forgiveness. And it's after Jesus was arrested and falsely convicted and, and the, the order was given that he would be beaten, he'd be flogged, he'd be crucified, hung on the cross until he is dead. And Jesus is on the cross. He's hanging. He is in excruciating pain at the moment of greatest pain, physically but spiritually, because the sins of the world have been heaped on him. And so God the Father is withdrawing his presence the first time and the only time that God the Father and the Son are separate Jesus is experiencing this pinnacle of pain. And in that moment, he speaks. And in the audience that hears are the people who literally drove the stakes through his wrists and his ankles. In the audience are the people who said, yep, crucify him. 
And in the audience are his disciples. And what does he say? My judgment on them is perfect. I will not forgive you for this unrighteous act. No, no, no. Luke 23, 34 records something very, very different. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. Father, forgive them. Can you imagine the shock? Seeing Jesus suffering and yet in that moment he responds with forgive them. Forgive them. So what does Jesus' forgiveness look like? I think this scene reveals to us a little bit more about Jesus' forgiveness. Jesus' forgiveness is loving. It's loving. His forgiveness is driven by a deep and ongoing love for every person who has ever lived or will ever live. Jesus willingly embraced the most painful consequence in order to perfectly demonstrate his love. His forgiveness is loving. His forgiveness is gracious. His forgiveness is gracious. Grace is unmerited favor, unearned kindness. Jesus' forgiveness of me and you is completely unearned. It is not deserved, and yet it is freely given. It is unearned, not deserved, and yet it is freely given. Jesus' forgiveness is sacrificial. He gave up everything in order to forgive. His forgiveness is complete. His forgiveness is complete. He's not hanging on to hurt. He's not saying, um, I'm, I'm forgiving you about 80% of the way for that sin that, that was so egregious. No, no, no. His, his forgiveness of our sin is complete. As far as the East is from the West, so far have I removed your transgressions from you. His forgiveness is complete. And the last thing I want to share is his forgiveness is relationship focused. God's greatest desire is for every person to have a restored relationship with him through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Through the death of Jesus and his resurrection, he wants to have a restored relationship with every single person. This is a relationally driven, a relationally focused forgiveness. And really cool, just to think about this, when Jesus says to people in the gospels, your sin is forgiven, your faith has healed you. Does he say that through someone else? Does he say that through a disciple? Oh yeah, yeah, go tell them that their sin is forgiven. No, he says it face to face. He says that right in front of the person whose sin he is forgiving. Jesus' forgiveness is relationally focused. To forgive as Jesus, to forgive just as Jesus forgave is an incredibly high call. It's an incredibly high command. It's one that's so difficult for you and I to obey. And if we are going to do that, it requires that we follow the example of Jesus in regards to denying himself. He denied himself of his heavenly rights as God in the flesh. And yet, if we are to forgive as he forgave, we need to deny ourselves of our fleshly rights. Our flesh has been corrupted by sin in this world. Our flesh has its desire to justify ourselves, to do what we think is best, to say, well, that's not fair. They don't deserve it. They didn't earn it, whatever it may be. And in order to forgive just as Jesus forgave, we must choose to deny our fleshly rights. We must choose to deny our fleshly rights. Now, let me just pause and say this, this is not an easy call. And I am not trying to oversimplify this because when we need to forgive, it means that somebody else has done something incredibly hurtful to us, whether in a simple way or a difficult, complex way, over the years way, I don't know what hurts, what burdens, what scars you bear. But what I am not trying to do is to oversimplify a complex issue. And yet in the midst of that reality, the truth is this is our hurt. And regardless of our hurt and how deep and personal and painful it is, the call remains constant. And that is to forgive just as Jesus forgave. So why? Why should we forgive just as Jesus forgave? 
I've already said this, I'm going to repeat it because it's essential. Forgiveness is a God-given, Jesus-modeled command. Forgiveness is a God-given, Jesus-modeled command. That means it's not when we feel like it. It's not when we think the person deserves it or they've earned it or we think they're actually truly sorry. It's a God-given, Jesus-modeled command. Which basically, would to put it differently, why? Is obedience to the example of Christ. Secondly, it leads to a more abundant life. It leads to a more abundant life. Years ago, a friend of mine, Chris Kaiser, invited me to go to Beyond Malibu, which is a young life camp up in Canada, and it's a backpacking expedition. And I was on a team of 11 guys plus two guides, so 13 of us all together. And so we went up into the woods, and um, on day two, we were already above the tree line. We were above the tree line for four days. An inconvenient truth that I love, that I learned on this trip is when you're above the tree line and it's wet, you have to pack out your waist. <laughs> Did I mention 13 guys, four days above the tree line? Oh, it was wet every day. I'll just say this, it involved a paper towel making a burrito and putting it in a bag that we called the Biff bag. It was yellow, it was waterproof, it was not airtight. And then we took turns carrying the Biff bag. On the last day, it was my turn. So I took 13 guys, four days down the hill with me and it was the last day. So it was descent. Every time I would step forward, the bag would swing and hit me. It would swing and hit me. It would swing and hit me. And some of you see where this is going. It was uncomfortable. It was a burden. It, it wrecked my stability. It was just unpleasant. And every time it swung and it hit, it was not airtight, which meant there was a very wretched fragrance that enveloped me most of the way down the hill. It was not awesome. It was gross. And some of you are like, ew. Yep. That sums it up. Ew. Now, why do I tell you that? <laughs> Great question, right? <laughs> well, I tell you that because I think when we say yes to Jesus' call to forgive just as he did, we experience what I experienced at the end of that day. At the end of that day, I got to take off my pack. I got to take off the Biff bag. And I'm here to tell you my response was freedom, like, oh yes. It was freedom, it was peace, and it was certainly joyful. When we choose to forgive, just as Christ forgave, we experience a deep freedom. We experience peace like no other, and there is a joy. But when we refuse to forgive, we are choosing to carry that pack with the Biff bag on it every day, wherever we go. It is uncomfortable. It is exhausting. It affects the way that we feel. It affects the way that we interact with others. It affects the way we interact with God. And Jesus' command is put it down. Forgive just as I have forgiven you. Forgive just as I have forgiven you. And then one more reason. So the first, again, um, it, we want to, why forgive just as Jesus? To obey him. The second is it leads to a more abundant life. And the third thing that I want to share that's not a fill in the blank is because if you believe in Jesus Christ and you've received his forgiveness, you have experienced that freedom, that peace, and that joy. You've come to him and said, God, I am so sorry for this thing that I did, this thing that I thought, this repetitious sin that I can't seem to break the cycle of. And when you do that and you receive his forgiveness, it leads to freedom. It leads to peace. It leads to joy. It leads to a more abundant life. Let me just be real blunt with us today. When we say to Jesus, I long for that for me, but I am unwilling to give it to that person because of what they did to me, it's flat out hypocritical. It is flat out hypocritical. And it is not godly. Now again, I acknowledge 
that some of us are carrying such deep wounds that this is difficult, beyond difficult. This is almost painful to consider forgiving them and yet to say, I'm going to cling to this and I will never forgive them is to willfully disobey God and his will for your life, for my life. If you've been around Cornwall for any period of time, you've probably heard this quote in regards to forgiveness, but it is so good. It's by Lewis Smedes. It says this, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and to discover that the prisoner was you. It's to discover that you set a prisoner free and that you realize that prisoner was you. We sometimes think, I'm not gonna forgive them. I'm gonna punish them for what they did. I'm not gonna let them go. The impact is far greater on you than it is on them. And so Jesus' command is that we would choose to forgive. So let's get practical. How do we do this? The first thing that we do is we seek and receive God's sacrificial forgiveness. We seek and receive God's sacrificial forgiveness. This is praying um, Psalm 139, verse 23, 24. Search me and know me. See if there's any ungodly way in me. God, show me what I am guilty of so that I can bring it to you and ask you to forgive me for it, that we would seek God's forgiveness. Um, King David in Psalm 51, after he committed, committed adultery with Bathsheba, says this, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. King David goes to the throne of God and says, Meet me and forgive me. I am so sorry for what I have done. I'm so sorry for what I've done. And then receive his forgiveness. I think many of us can conceptually receive his forgiveness, but we don't actually feel totally separated or that, or that the debt is totally paid for. It's like, okay, that's awesome. God forgives me cerebrally, but, but we don't receive it on a heart level. And let me just invite you to remind yourself of truth. I mentioned Psalm 103 before. Psalm 103 verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. First John 1 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. You are forgiven. If you go to Jesus, you are completely forgiven. Receive his forgiveness. The second thing is that if you want to forgive, by the way, we cannot forgive others unless we have been forgiven by God. And secondly, we cannot forgive others unless we forgive ourselves unless we forgive ourselves. I want to say something that is obvious on the surface, but I don't know that it's ultimately obvious to, to the depth of, of our hearts. You are not perfect. <laughs> right? You are not perfect. I am not perfect. And yet sometimes the standard that I hold myself to feels even greater than the standard God holds me to. And so I'm like, that's awesome, God, you forgave me, but I am not going to let go. I did that thing again. I feel terrible about myself. I'm not going to. Let me just say this. God loves you. And it has nothing to do with your performance. It has nothing to do with your perfection. Because you are not perfect. So do not expect yourself to be perfect. And unless you think I'm preaching at you, I am preaching at myself right now. Because I have a tendency to be like, Scott, you done messed up again. And I hang it over myself again and again, and I hold on to that. We need to let go because unless we are willing to forgive ourselves, to show ourselves grace, we will not be able to forgive other people. The third thing is that we would forgive others readily and frequently. That we would forgive others readily and frequently. What I mean by this is as soon as you become aware that somebody says something or does something to you that is hurtful, that, that you respond to with feeling bad about yourself or anger or defensiveness, you have been, just been offended. And as soon as you realize that you are offended, instead of entertaining like harsh thoughts about them for what they've done to you, may we readily say, God, I forgive them for what they just did 
for what they just said. I want to release them and I want to invite your blessing upon them, that we would readily do that, that we wouldn't even, even give space for our hearts to be hardened because we want them to get what they deserve. Scripture says in Ephesians 4, Verse 26 and 7, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. When we entertain bitterness, resentment, rage, anger, when we entertain wanting revenge on that person, Satan wants to move in and harden our heart. He wants, he is battling for our heart and mind. And when we refuse to forgive We are inviting that. We are opening ourselves up to his attack. But when we say, God, that hurt, that was awful. I took that personally, but Lord, I forgive them. I forgive them. It's our offensive attack against Satan. It is saying, God, I want to forgive just as you forgave. Is it easy? No, but I want to walk in obedience because I do not want to give the enemy a foothold. And that we would forgive frequently. And what I mean by that is as frequently as we are offended, as we are hurt, that we would as frequently forgive them. It could be a silent prayer just to yourself. It could be a conversation that you go to and you talk to that person. And you say, what you just did, what you just said was hurtful to me, but I want you to know I forgive you. Is this easy? No. Is it life-giving? Absolutely. Absolutely, because we walk in the way of Jesus. Now, how much, how frequently do we do this? Well, a guy came to Jesus and said, should I forgive him seven times? And Jesus' response was, no, not seven, either 77 times or 70 times seven times, depending on the translation. And the point is the same, regardless of translation, and that is there should be no end to your forgiveness of them. Now, in case you're like, say what? Would you want God's forgiveness of you to be limited? I don't. (laughs) I definitely don't. Because even if it's 70 times 7, 490, I'm going to get there easily within a year. I'm not glorifying sin. I'm just acknowledging I am far from perfect. And I do not want God's grace and forgiveness to be limited to one year of my life. I need it for every year of my life. And similarly, we are called to readily and frequently forgive people who offend us, who sin against us, who hurt us. Now, with that said, healthy boundaries may be necessary in your situation. Somebody may be coming up, a relationship may be coming to mind right now. And what I am not saying is that you need to continue to subject yourself to an abusive situation, um, whether it be at work, at home, in a friendship, in a dating relationship. Like there needs to be boundaries that you put up where you may say, I'm limiting my my conversation with this person. I'm limiting my um, time spent with this person. But you willingly set up a boundary. You wisely set up a healthy boundary to say, I will not continue to subject myself because I have talked to them. I have forgiven them and they continue to mistreat me. They continue to repeat the sins against me and I am not willing to continue just to subject myself to that. And even in those moments, the call for you, for me to forgive remains. It remains. Why? We don't want to open our heart to the attack of Satan. We want to walk in the ways of Jesus Christ because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And the life. Okay, the last thing is this, that we would pray often for you and for them. That we would pray often for you and for them. Now, why would I need to pray for myself? Because forgiving is really hard. It's really hard. I've learned that in this last year. It is really hard. And so prayer can be as something as simple as, I'm going to use the name Sam, that does not reflect a real person in my life, but Sam does or says something to me that is hurtful. And it, my prayer may be simply, God, Sam did this, and man, it, it embarrassed me, it made me feel insignificant, it made me question my worth. And so God, I want to forgive him, and I need your help to forgive him. 
I need you to clean my heart and my mind of any residual bitterness or resentment that dwells within me. God, would you search me and know me? Would you clean out my heart? Because I don't want any of that darkness remaining and I need to do this in an ongoing way. God, would you give me the strength and the courage to love Sam even though he hurt me? Would you give me the courage and strength and the knowledge and wisdom to know if I need to have this conversation with Sam? And if so, God, would you help me have it graciously, but firmly? So we could pray something along those lines, but then we're praying for this person. Lord, would you continue the good work in Sam's life that you started long ago? You know the plans you have for him. And I want you to continue to grow and develop him into a man after your own heart. If he doesn't know you, would you help him to see that you are real, that you are involved and that you love him and that your grace is sufficient and you forgive him. And if there's any woundedness that Sam is acting out of, would you help him see it so that he can pursue healing for it? God, please bless Sam. Now, as we pray for ourselves, we're inviting God to move in us in a powerful way. We need that support in order to forgive the way Jesus is calling us to forgive. But we also, as we pray for Sam, not only are we inviting God to do something in him that we can't, but it also helps keep our hearts soft towards Sam because it's the reminder that God loves him despite his shortcomings, just as God loves me despite the way I hurt others unintentionally right? That we would pray for you, for us, for ourselves, and for the person who has hurt us. Now, I want to speak to a very specific audience just for a moment. Some of you have gotten to a place where you've experienced such hurt, such trauma, that you may have said, I will never forgive them. What they did was too dark, too evil, too painful. I will never forgive them. And know that what I'm about to share is with a heart of empathy and love. I don't know the circumstances, but I'm sure that what you experienced really was awful. And in the midst of that, going back to Smead's quote, When we refuse to give forgiveness, when we refuse to forgive that person, we are enslaving ourselves. And healing cannot be completed when we are unwilling to forgive. And I believe that even in the midst of that deep hurt that you carry with you, that God wants to meet you there and lead you to a place where you can say, I forgive them. And maybe that's not to their face. Maybe that's simply between you and God because you're thinking, there's no way I want to interact with that person again. But to carry unforgiveness with you is to carry that pain, to carry death, to carry hardship. God says, I have put before you life and death. Now choose life. We find life when we walk in the way of Jesus, death when we don't. And so Perhaps if you're in a place where you've said that and you are still carrying that bag of unforgiveness, perhaps your first step is simply to enter into a prayer conversation with God where prayerfully you would say, God, this is where I am. I don't know how I could possibly forgive this person because what they did was unthinkable. And yet, Lord, I see that your call on my life, your command from my life is to forgive them. And I have no clue how to get from here to here. This seems impassable, but Lord, would you do a work in me? Would you help me see the way from unforgiveness to forgiveness? Because Lord, I want to be obedient to what you're calling me to. And if you're in that place, it may mean that that you have a conversation with a pastor or a Christian counselor that can help meet you and, and unpack what's going on there and the hurt that's there and the way to get from here to forgiveness But my prayer is that you would willingly do that. I want to strongly encourage you to pursue that 
Because I truly believe that there is a greater impact on your life than you are aware of, on your relationship with God, on your relationship with yourself and with others, and not just that individual, but everyone else that you interact with. The impact is far greater. So God calls us to forgive just as Jesus forgave. And when we do, it leads to freedom. It leads to peace. And it leads to joy, a deep joy. So my encouragement for us, my challenge for us is to ask the question, who do I need to forgive just like Jesus? Who do I need to forgive just like Jesus? Is it someone in my family, someone I work with, someone at school, a teacher, a professor? Is it someone I work with? Is it a boss? Is it a neighbor? Is it a stranger? Who is it that I need to forgive just like Jesus? And would you invite God to meet you in that and help you understand what that next step looks like for you? Because again, freedom and peace and joy await. When we forgive just as Jesus did, it is a, it, we, we show a compelling picture of the kingdom of God. We are an example of what the gospel is all about. The center of, of the gospel is forgiveness. And when we willingly forgive someone who is unworthy, undeserving of our forgiveness, because that's how we've received forgiveness, we are effectively reflecting the gospel, the good news of great joy for all the people. For all the people. May we forgive just as Jesus forgave. Let me pray for us. God, you are so great. Would you meet every one of my brothers and sisters where they are and what they're experiencing? Would you continue to help them see what their next step is, Lord? Would you give them the courage to take it, the strength? Would they just continue to depend on you? Lord, we need your help to forgive just as you did. But Lord, I truly believe because I have experienced it that when we forgive just as you forgave, there is freedom, there is peace, and there is a deep joy. I love you and I pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, amen.